Hey everyone, Dr. Jay Gordy, and in the previous videos, we kind of met the players of the immune system, the neutrophils, the macrophages, the T cells, and so on. In the next couple of videos, I'm going to sort of tell you the story of how those players all interact to sort of give you a big picture of the immune response from beginning to end. Um, this beautiful image here is actually chronic inflammation going on in the brain of um, a, a person with dementia. Um, and we can see the innate immune response going on here in inflammation. These green clusters are inflammation going on there. And that's um, a big term. Inflammation is a term for the innate immune response and the sort of vascular and immune responses that occur during inflammation. So let's jump into it. Let's jump into the innate immune response. And then the next video, I'll cover the adaptive immune response. So here we have a macrophage and a resident immune cell. It's important, most uh, immune responses start with these resident immune cells that are living in tissue. Um, and so what do we call tissue cells? We call them parenchymal cells. So here's our macrophage surrounded by parenchymal cells and we've got a blood vessel running through there. Now, say we get an infection and actually because the innate immune response does almost the exact same response depending on no matter what pathogen it gets exposed to what i'm about to say kind of applies to bacterial fungal and viral infections right once we get this pathogen in the extracellular milieu the extracellular soup the extracellular fluid this is what's going to happen right so pathogens release molecules that are unique to those pathogens right and we call those pathogen associated molecular patterns or PIMPs pathogen associated molecular patterns and so here we can see a bacteria leaking some pathogen associated molecular patterns now what are some examples of PIMPs virtually anything I've taught you um, about pathogens is a PIMP so here we've got um, gram negative gram positive bacteria here we have the cell wall of a fungus here we have a virus and here we have a worm that's producing mucus and then mucus helps protect it from digestive enzymes because it's living in the intestine of a human being for example there are PIMPs everywhere on this image so peptide glycan layers right peptide glycans which are in both gram negative and gram positive bacteria but are much more so in gram positive bacteria they are a PIMP right they are a chemical that leaks out of the bacteria into the extracellular milieu that can be detected by our immune system so there are pathogen associated molecular patterns the manoprotein remember these are these um uh, proteins that have had the mano sugar molecule chains of them attached to the fungus to allow it to interact with the extracellular environment they are a PAMP but also glucan is a PAMP which is another part of the fungal cell wall chitin which is the defining feature of fungus is also a um is also a PAMP our immune system has learned to respond to the mucus that comes off these helminth parasites that is also a PAMP and indeed the very famous spike protein that we see on the coronavirus aka the SARS-CoV-2 virus which is a more accurate term when we're talking about the virus yeah so the spike protein itself is also a pathogen associated molecular pattern and it doesn't have to break off from the virus we can detect it on the virus itself so these PIMs are detected by receptors all over the resident immune cells and other immune cells as well. And these are called pattern recognition receptors because they recognize the molecular patterns that are being released by the pathogen. So we've got pathogen associated molecular patterns, PIMs, being recognized by pattern recognition receptors. PRRs. So here we can see on the surface of this macrophage there's a receptor. That receptor has bound one of these PAMs that has come off a bacterial infection. Now we have loads of PAMs and honestly it's very analogous to smelling right. We've got loads of smell receptors that can smell all sorts of millions of chemicals um, that go up our nose. Well they are receptors essentially what we're smell when we smell something we're smelling something with our receptors these immune cells are coated in receptors hundreds of these receptors that can sort of smell out each one of the pathogens so here's a famous group here the toll like receptors um, here's the lectin receptors here's a bunch of internal receptors um, that work within the cytosol so they sort of sniff out what has been 
phagocytosed um, inside the uh, pathogen. Now, just to give you an idea of research and how complicated biology is, such that an individual researcher needs to spend their life trying to understand just one or two molecular processes. Virtually my entire research career is researching this one guy here, right? Um, NLRP3. Out of all of these receptors, this is the one I know and love the most and would consider myself, you know, knowledgeable on. The rest of them, I would just say I only have a cursory, they're acquaintances, they're biological acquaintances. Um, I am married to NLRP3 and I really understand it at a deep level. Um, so each biologist out there might only know one or two of these on a real detailed level. It's just interesting to know that this is how deep we're into science, right? Um, that we have to be so specific to become an expert and learn even more about even just one thing. Now, the key thing there is don't learn any of that. There are hundreds of pattern recognition receptors. And when I want to know what exactly TLR10 does, I will look it up, right? There's no point in memorizing these hundreds of pattern recognition receptors. But the key thing is to know that there are pattern recognition receptors that essentially smell the PAMPs in the extracellular space, the pathogen associated molecular patterns in the extracellular space. And they all work virtually the same way. Most of them do. There are one or two exceptions, but they work via this lock and key mechanism, right? They are a receptor um, that has pockets and those pockets um, have certain binding domains that are really good at binding just one or two, what's called a ligand, which is something that interacts with it right so something that activates a receptor is called a ligand so pathogen associated molecular patterns are ligands for these receptors so for example um TLR4 can detect uh, a particular component of a bacterial cell wall, normally a gram-negative bacterial cell wall component. So TLR4 is like a lock, and the only and the key that is best at opening that lock and causing that secondary signaling in the cytosol is that component of the bacterial cell wall. So it is the key that unlocks that response through that receptor. And that's what gives it its specificity to. You can't jam any key in there. It's not gonna have the right things to interact with the pocket of the receptor. Just like a key, uh, the wrong key won't have the right shape to interact correctly with the uh, lock unless it's the exact right one. So that's how most of these PRRs work, the pattern recognition receptors. Funnily enough, the one I, I do, NLRP3, doesn't work like that. But there are exceptions. So, but 95% of them work like this, right? Like a lock and key mechanism. Okay, so now we've got the detection um, via the pattern recognition receptor of this PAMP. What's going to happen next? Well, they're going to release a bunch of signaling molecules. And one of the main groups of signaling molecules, the vast majority of immune cell communication occurs through this main group of signaling molecules and they are called cytokines. Now these are protein signaling molecules so what that means is we need a gene to be turned on. So this pattern recognition receptor here will have secondary signaling cascades that will turn on some genes in the nucleus that correspond to cytokines. They will create proteins called cytokines that will be released that cause this immune response. Now again there's over a I tried to count them up. I counted at least 117 different cytokines, but there's probably more, right? And we're discovering more all the time. And any one cytokine, there's lots of different variations within that cytokine too. So there's, again, not a lot of point in memorizing these 120 cytokines. I don't think there's anyone on the planet that knows what all 117 cytokines that I could find do, for example. Um, but there are a few famous ones that you'll see over and over again, and it's definitely worth knowing then. So uh, one of them is called interleukin-1. Now, interleukin is a group of cytokines. So again, we're sort of breaking this up, um, but don't worry about it. Interleukins is just the name of those proteins. Inter means in, leukins means leukocytes, and that's because that's where we found them first, right? We found the interleukins inside of leukocytes, but they're actually secreted by them, and, you know, they're secreted by things that aren't leukocytes, like resident immune cells. Anyway, so... 
Uh, a very famous one is interleukin-1. This is one I work on. Um, it's, it's one of my babies. And interleukin-1 is one of these master cytokines that's very famous that it's worth knowing about. So interleukin-1, we always abbreviate this down to IL-1. So if you say IL-1 at any point in time, everyone knows what you're talking about. Uh, but it's yeah, its full name is interleukin-1. Now, interleukin-1 signals inflammation. Now, it does this again through that lock and key receptor-based um, communication method, right? So there are certain cells in your body that have the key that can fit the IL-1. No, have the lock that can fit the IL-1 key. So uh, a couple of examples are your immune cells like neutrophils but also the cells of the blood vessels. Now, these are called endothelial cells. And this causes uh, both vascular responses and immune responses. Right, so some of the vascular responses is to become leaky. So we see these gaps form in the blood vessels, right? Now, this does uh, a few things. One thing is, is it lets humoral immunity get into the tissue, right? So humoral immunity, remember, that's your antibodies or your complements. That's your protein component of the immune response not the cellular but the protein and remember complement is just these magical proteins that can recognize and kill pathogens and antibodies are like glue they can coat pathogens preventing them from doing anything so if your blood vessels become leaky then the fluid rushes in and we get that humoral immunity flushing into the tissue to help you deal with that pathogen now we also get vasodilation you can actually see that blood vessel is now bigger um, now the vasodilation is to get more blood there, more humoral immunity there, but also more immune cells, circulating immune cells there. Now you can imagine if you've got things swelling up and leaking fluid, uh, you've got blood vessels dilating and leaking fluid, that tissue is going to swell up. And we see this during inflammation, right? If you get an infection or even you, if you roll your ankle, it will swell up, right? And that's that fluid rushing in and your immune cells rushing in and vasodilation rushing in, uh, vasodilation occurring to increase the volume of that tissue. Um, and lastly, we get immune cell migration into the tissue. Here we can see that neutrophil squeezing through these small gaps between the blood vessel cells to enter the tissue, but also monocytes are going to come in too and a range of other immune cells. So the immune cells, upon activation, can now stick to the blood vessel wall and migrate. And, and this is actually one of the reasons we believe why they have weird-shaped nuclei is it allows them to squeeze through these tiny gaps between those endothelial cells, which is super cool. So now we've got an immune response occurring, right? We're going to innate immune response occurring. So we get neutrophil degranulation. Here we go. We've got neutrophil degranulating. And remember, it's releasing an enzyme that can produce bleach, for example, and bleach kills everything. So we've got this lysed uh, uh, bacterial cell here. And that's because the, the cell wall was attacked by the bleach molecule, and now it's porous, and so the cell is going to lyse. We get neutrophil, monocyte, and macrophage phagocytosis. So all these innate immune cells can start eating pathogens, which is actually an important component um, of the immune response. And the monocytes also typically take over the cytokine secretion process. Macrophages are doing it too. Neutrophils are doing it, but at a, at a lower capacity than the other two. So um, because macrophages um, can die during cytokine release, as well as after eating 100 or so bacteria, they can be exhausted and give up. It's often the monocytes that come in that sort of take over that cytokine secretion role to coordinate the immune response. Um, and then we need it all to come down. If, if the innate immune system wins, if the complement proteins lies the bacteria, the neutrophils producing bleach lies the bacteria, if all the phagocyto phagocytes can eat all the pathogens, we need the immune system to calm down. And so what happens next is we get anti-inflammatory cytokines and other signaling molecules. There's a lot of other processes going on. Actually, just a quick side note, everything I'm telling you is an oversimplification. And in later videos, uh, we'll go into way more detail much, much later videos. Um, in fact, I've got a whole different playlist called Advanced Immunology if you want to know a few more of the, these details going on. 
But an oversimplification of it is we get anti-inflammatory signaling molecules that start to turn everything off. They say we need to get back to normal because um, we've won this battle, right? So we've got a neutrophil apoptosing there. We've got the blood vessels have resealed up. And that's all thanks to these lovely cooling anti-inflammatory cytokines. So not all cytokines bump the immune system up. Some of them tell the immune system to calm back down. But what happens if this doesn't work, right? The bleach doesn't work, the phagocytosis doesn't work, there's too much of an infection going on and it overwhelms the innate immune system. That is when we're gonna to need to call in the CIA. We need, we've tried, we've tried the tanks, we've tried the, the crude um, damaging approach. We need, it didn't work, so we need to, we need to get that, those specific bad boys to come on in and start to deal with these problems. So we need the CIA. So that's when we need to head to the adaptive immune system, and that is what I'm gonna cover in the next video.